Some encounters change our lives. Some take us on a journey. And some journeys take an unexpected course. My name is Jens Klingebier. I'm a wildlife filmmaker, and I'd like to tell you about my journey. For almost a year, I've been traveling the world on behalf of a man who came to me with a very special request. He wanted me to make a film for him, a film showing the beauty of nature that surrounds us but also a film that takes stock of our relationship with nature. And for this, he gave me his life savings. He was suffering from terminal cancer. Metastases had spread throughout his body. His last wish, to make a contribution towards nature conservation and this is his legacy. What traces of our lives do we leave behind? Environmental destruction, climate change, species extinction, exploitation of animals. Is this what we want to bequeath to future generations? These are the questions this man asked himself in his final days. And that's why he contacted me. He wanted to remain anonymous. He's not interested in recognition or money. His one condition, the film should reach as many people as possible and at best make them think and change their views. So, I set off on a journey. Unsure of just what awaits me. The first stage takes me to the island of Heligoland in the German Bight. It's December. The Heligoland I know is bitterly cold around this time of year. But like everywhere, the seasons are disappearing. Here on Heligoland, I set off in search of Germany's biggest predator. Not so long ago, these dunes were deserted in winter. Gray seals were classified as extinct in Germany. Now some 500 young seal pups are born each year, thanks to rigorous protective measures. Mankind as conservationist, a success story. The will is certainly there. I can observe the animals on the beach undisturbed. Right in front of me, there's a female gray seal. She's lying apart from the others. Among all the high-spirited males, it's hard to find the quiet she needs so badly right now. Not far away, I discover a very young seal in the water. As a rule, seal pups don't swim this early because their fur is not water repellent yet. Wet clothing, not a pleasant thought. Vigilance is the word now. Because the males are looking for partners, they don't bother to watch out for the little ones. But you don't mess around with a mother seal. No one is allowed near her baby.
there's virtually nothing stronger than the bond between mother and child. The reason why this privacy-seeking female has distanced herself is now clear. She is in labor. And I'm privileged to witness one of the greatest wonders of nature. Another little seal pup is born, a symbol of the rigorous protection of a species. The birth hasn't escaped the proud father either. Wet and vulnerable, the little seal pup is totally dependent on the protection of its parents because the birth has not gone unnoticed. Gulls, magpies, and crows smell prey. But it's not the seal pup they're after. They're interested in the afterbirth. The proximity of the birds doesn't please the mother at all. She must protect her newborn baby at all costs. The afterbirth is left as a feast for the birds. Seals were actually extinct in Germany due to us humans. Now we have successfully ensured their return. Yet no sooner have their numbers recovered than there are public calls to allow them to be shot. Why? The eternal paradox of human behavior. For me, it's time to continue my journey, and so I leave Heligoland. My destination is the fjords of northern Norway. Now in December, all around Tromsø, the herring shoals start to swarm through the fjords. They're closely followed by whales, constantly in search of food for themselves and their offspring. But there's another hunter following the shoals of herring, and it isn't content with satisfying its own appetite. With huge fishing trawlers, it catches whatever it can, insatiable. All the whales can do is retreat. I want to go out into the Arctic Ocean to see with my own eyes how many whales have stayed behind. Here in the north of Norway, winter still appears to be cold and icy. One might well ask where this global warming is supposed to be. The days are short. It's only light for a few hours, and even then, it's more a kind of twilight. I go out to sea on one of the whale watching boats. Luckily, tourism is now more lucrative than hunting. There are as many humpback whales today as there were before commercial whaling started. Another success story, actually. We're out for hours, but we don't find any whales. They've disappeared from the fjords much earlier than usual. There was simply no more food for them, humans, our fierce competition. Our appetite for all this planet's resources is unbridled. 
The journey continues towards Sweden on white, icy roads, snow drifts and biting cold. Sudden braking isn't easy in these conditions. I keep seeing black bags at the side of the road. They're a sign, not about moose. They're about reindeer. Reindeer like to stand around next to or even on the road. Because all reindeer belong to the Sami people, these bags along the roadside can be seen as a request to watch out for the animals. Mostly, they work. But drivers of vehicles whose weight makes their braking distance longer anyway seem to ignore these requests. I keep seeing run over reindeer on the side of the road. Animals sacrificed for speed. A sad sight and a depressing thought. Up here in the north, the wind howls. It's bitterly cold. But the further south I go, the less the weather seems to correspond to the season. In Scandinavia too, the seasons have changed. When I arrive in central Sweden, in Mura, on lovely Lake Siljan, there's only slush on the ground. This is where the famous annual Vasa race takes place, a cross-country skiing event the Mora I know is usually buried deep in snow at this time of year. I wonder if there'll be a real winter at all here this year. Further on, through a landscape lightly dusted with snow, peaceful Småland awaits, the home of Pippi Longstocking and Ronja, the robber's daughter. This is the house, and this is the flagpole Emil of Lüneberg used to hoist up his sister, a childhood memory. How quickly time flies. The famous Swedish author Astrid Lindgren lived in Vimmerby and wrote her books here. But she also campaigned for animal rights. It's thanks to her that the laws governing animal husbandry were tightened in Sweden. Near Vimmerby, I arrive at a pasture in the forest. Domestic pigs live here, free to roam as nature intended. And they're inquisitive. The farmer keeps around 600 pigs here in expansive pastures. The pigs transform the meadow very quickly, but they're fond of mud in any case. These pigs are outside all year round. They can form social hierarchies, keep their distance, or sleep together on thick beds of straw. I don't see any chewed-off tails here. No injuries or wounds, as you do in the stalls of factory farms. I see pigs interacting with each other, being inquisitive, enjoying life. The farmer calls them Glode Ute Grisar, happy outdoor pigs. I tell my client about this. He has been vegan for years and maintains that exploitation is exploitation. I can well understand that. But wouldn't it simply be a matter of decency, of humanity? If we don't want to do without meat, shouldn't we at least treat the animals properly? Do we really have to keep them in such deplorable conditions just so that we can produce dirt, cheap meat at any cost? But the animal's suffering is by no means the only problem with factory farming. To produce meat, we use vast expanses of land. The lungs of the world, the Amazon, are being sacrificed for it. Fine dust, polluted water, 
Overfertilized soil, climate change. That is the real price we have to pay for a piece of meat. The trip and the conversations with a man lead me to consider what conclusions can I draw so far? We have to show responsibility, live more sustainably, preserve what we have. It's all about the future of coming generations, and they are the ones that give me courage. Young people are standing up and demanding to be heard. Images like this stir hope inside me. Something seems to be happening. Young people are demanding our world has to change. And it can change. But just how fast, no one could have guessed. And it was not a rethink, no realization, no movement that achieved it. It was a virus. Early 2020, from China to the rest of the world. No problem in this globalized world of ours. It's said to have started in a wet market. Patient zero of all things, the highly endangered pangolin. Many say it's nature striking back. Reports of a mysterious lung disease in far off China are on the rise. And in no time, the virus is on our doorstep. What no one would have thought imaginable becomes a reality within just a few days. Empty airports, grounded planes, cruise ships at anchor. People around the world not allowed to leave the house. No traveling, no celebrations, full stop. Within a few days, infection numbers rise. Deaths around the world lead to lockdowns everywhere. But nature can breathe again, at least for a while. There is clean water again and clean air. The sky is a most beautiful blue, not a jet trail in sight. My client's chemotherapy is stopped. He's faring badly. The film has to be finished, despite COVID-19. The virus turned our world upside down, and other issues once again take a back seat. In the next two to three decades, we will face far more serious problems. With increasing frequency, we're experiencing record heat waves, droughts, failed harvests. Researchers have calculated that large swaths of the planet will have become almost uninhabitable by 2050. Food and water shortages will shrink the world for us human beings. The virus has also affected this documentary. We can no longer access film locations abroad. But there are more than enough signs of climate change here in Germany. Our forests are changing. We don't have to wait until 2050 for that. The droughts over the past few years have made life easy for the bark beetle. Spruce trees are the first to die off. But beech and oak trees are suffering too. How will our landscapes have changed in just a few years? If the drought persists, will streams dry up? It's not just trees that depend on there being enough water in the forests. If there is no water, the consequences are far-reaching. 
eventually affecting animals too. The cranes in the forests of western Pomerania need marshy, wet terrain. They hatch their chicks in damp alder forests. But for years, these important wet areas have gradually been disappearing. The forests are drying out. Over the past 15 years, crane brood numbers have dropped by more than half. One creature who would quite fancy a nice crane egg is the fox. Eat and be eaten, a law of nature. But the campaign of human versus fox is far from being the same thing. A dreadful example of this has happened in my neighboring village. A photographer friend was observing fox cubs in front of their lair. Twelve meters away, he lay hidden and waiting with his camera. A fox in his sights, peaceful in the sun. His finger was on the shutter release. So his camera caught what happened next. The fox was shot. The cubs starved. This incident of a fox being shot during the closed season caused outrage around Germany, and perhaps it might actually lead to more stringent nature conservation. What happens in an intact natural environment can be seen among the cranes. A chick has hatched. The second egg needs a little more warmth. For the parents, the challenge begins. They must find enough food for their offspring, but all around them only monoculture. Insects are a scarce commodity here. They only find what they need in the marshy forest. Crane chicks are precocial. Just hours after they hatch, they're already following their parents in search of food. As virtual newborns, they're already forced to begin their fight for survival. The parents will still help them for a couple of weeks. They show them where food is to be found, provide protection and warmth. The chicks have to manage everything else themselves. Animal and nature conservation can also take place on a smaller scale. A wild, natural garden is an ideal habitat for many species. They benefit one another. Do our horses know that they provide vital support for breeding birds in spring? Songbirds have a hard time of it nowadays. Our feathered friends are especially affected by the disappearance of insects. Their broods are smaller or fail altogether. Gardens are emptier.
so it feels good to give birds active support at the beginning of their breeding season. They can always use building materials. For the great tit and green finch, animal hair is the perfect nest building material. The green finches are building their nest in a spruce tree. They busily fetch and carry the requisite materials. Setting up the green finch nest is the female's job. At least he's still keeping her company. But will he take any responsibility? A quick tryout of the half finished nest. And construction work continues. A fire crest has its eye on its neighbors. And while Mr. and Mrs. Greenfinch are gone, it strikes. The tiny bird is almost invisible. It's even smaller than a wren. But it's a master thief. Brazenly, it steals the laboriously gathered wadding from its neighbor's nest. And before anyone returns, the firecrest has already made off with its bounty. Weighing a mere four to six grams, it's hard to spot among the thick spruce branches. As for the greenfinch female, the bold robber has just increased her workload. With neighbors like that, who needs enemies? just a stone's throw away from the greenfinch's breeding spot. Right in the danger zone of the horse's hard hooves, one can just make out little piles of earth. This is where the great banded furrow bee has dug its breeding holes. It shouldn't actually reside here at all. It's migrated from southern Europe, a beneficiary of climate change. Like many other species, this bee is moving further and further north. For years, the signs of climate change have been evident everywhere in nature. One only has to look. The sandy soil of the paddock is ideal for the bee. It's found a new home here. I return once again to the place where I started this journey. On Heligoland, it's breeding time for some impressive birds. Northern gannets build their nests in the steep cliffs. They are also directly impacted by the way we humans treat nature. They build their nests using plastic waste. 95% of all nests on Heligoland contain plastic waste, old fishing nets, and nylon twine. It's very similar to the usual natural material used by the northern gannets to construct their nests, and it's a death trap. I see many dead birds scattered all over the rocks. On one rock in the glaring sun, a northern gannet has got its foot caught. It's still alive. It's been hanging here for two days. It's at the end of its strength. In most cases, they die from lack of water. It makes my heart ache to watch the bird. But it's more than just this bird's fate that's hanging by this thread. His partner is sitting on their nest. Their chick needs food urgently. 
Northern gannets take it in turns to hunt for food. The chick is begging, but the mother has nothing more to give it. She depends on the help of her partner. If he doesn't arrive soon, it will be too late. She will have to give up her brood. But can he win this unfair struggle? Although northern gannets are strong and weighing three kilograms, they can summon up tremendous strength. But he hasn't a chance this time. The plastic twine is strong and pinions him relentlessly to the cliff face. He won't be able to fight for much longer. Powerless to intervene, I watch his last struggle. I can't help him, only document his tragic end. For this northern gannet, it was about his own life and the life of his chick. And although we ourselves haven't really grasped it, for us human beings, it's about nothing less. Climate change and species extinction will have a direct effect on our children and grandchildren. New pandemics are not unlikely. We must decide today what is important to us. We must fight today. Individual prosperity should never be the grounds for placing the future of coming generations in jeopardy. Fantasies of endless growth, financial crises, viruses, mass migration caused by poverty, or the coming climate change. We stumble from one crisis to the next. If we are truly concerned about leaving behind a viable future for our children and grandchildren. Now is the time to rethink our actions. At the end of one's life, as the man showed us, money no longer matters. Despite his serious illness, he put the welfare of animals and nature before his own. He will likely never witness which path mankind chooses to take, all that remains for him is the hope that humanity will learn from its mistakes and the knowledge of his contribution towards that goal. <laughs>